Uh, good evening. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio. Uh, welcome to today's program, Practice in a Time of Product, presented by Gerard Damiani, AIA, with Studio DARC Architects. The fourth of a series of six lectures presented by AI Ohio this year. Before we start today's program, I'd like to recognize and thank our 2021 AIA Ohio annual sponsors highlight on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us present the innovative and quality programming we have been enjoying this year. I'd also like to thank those who made donations to the AIA Ohio Foundation as part of the registration process for the lecture series. For those members wishing to make a larger impact on the future of the profession, please consider joining me and our fellow members listed on the screen now who have invested a minimum of $1,000 in lifetime giving to the AI Ohio Foundation. If you're interested in learning more about the Charles Marr, please contact AI Ohio or president of the AI Ohio Foundation, Bruce Sakanik. Before we get started, I'd like to highlight a few of AI Ohio's upcoming programs. Next Wednesday, the Advocacy Committee will be presenting a workshop on implementing a successful advocacy program that will include speakers from AIA Seattle, Middle Tennessee, and AIA South Carolina. Also, there will be two more design lectures this year with one in July and one in August. Just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours. Tonight's lecture is planned to be more interactive and improvisational. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box, not in the Q&A box. So during the program, we'll be looking to the chat box to identify participants who would like to be unmuted to ask their question or we can ask it for you. A link will be placed in the chat box as well at the end of the presentation. Please follow the link to enter your information and member number so that you can receive your learning units for today's programs. Finally, I'd like to thank Robert Maschke for selecting the speakers and moderating the design series for AI Ohio this year. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Robert to introduce our design speaker for this evening's program. Robert. Thank you, Karen. After many years of academic training and professional experience, both in the US and abroad, Gerard Damiani established Studio D Arc Architects in 1996 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as an architects collaborative to pursue the union of architectural ideas with the craft of building. The mission of the practice continues to be one of creating quality architectural pro projects which understand and celebrate both our post-industrial and agrarian context, one of history, unique, unique building typologies, topography, as well as the present and future cultural context the urgent need for sustainable thinking and our own building trades and traditions. By analyzing these conditions, both physical and cultural, their work strives to be thoughtful, well-considered, and intrinsically linked to its place by creating architectural solutions that go beyond mere stylistic form making or pragmatic problem solving. The firm has a body of work that responds to the unique qualities of a region's site, program, budget, construction, and environment. Their sensitivity to the found conditions of place, design, process, use of humble materials, and cost-effective solutions set them apart from other offices. Many of SDA's projects utilize the found conditions of place as the starting point of the new formation. Even for projects of challenging constraints, efforts are made to select materials that are sensitive, sensitive to the region and immediate site, environmentally thoughtful, low in maintenance, and at the same time, create aesthetically pleasing spaces that are energy efficient. Whenever economically and technically possible, the use of recycled products and or repurposed building materials are used to best work with their clients' budget and life cycle costs. Please welcome Gerard Damiani. Thank you, Robert. It's good to be here. So thanks, thanks for inviting me to do this lecture. So hopefully you can hear me okay, Robert? Maybe yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Well, um, First of all, I want to thank Kate and Karen for thank you 
both for allowing this to happen and Robert and obviously for, for being interested in my work. We've known each other for a long time and I, I appreciate you wanting me to share the work because I, I really don't share the work too often. Um, I, I tend to like to kind of practice a bit in the shadows um, with this practice of mine. Um, and, and tonight, I think what we're going to do is I'll, I'm going to share with you the kind of philosophies of the office and, and, and the execution of these processes through, through work examples. And we're going to attempt to kind of make this a little bit more improvisational um, for everyone, because I think it's been a, it's been a long year um, with us all kind of working through kind of Zoom format. And, and I, I find this improvisational method probably Little bit and into the work and I'm happy to answer questions along the way and Robert you're going to help kind of mic in so to speak any questions that are coming up in the chat as well as Robert you, you you're going to ask potentially a few directing questions towards some projects as I go um, so Robert can you are you still out there yes I'm here I just muted to let you go so okay. Sounds good. Uh, you know just as a start uh, how do you blend your practice with your academic approach at Carnegie Mellon. How did the how did the two worlds collide? Yeah. Well, you know, I I've it, it's interesting. Like, you know, you as one of my architecture friends, you you kind of get this. I mean, you know, many of my friends who are practitioners, you know, call me kind of an academic, and many of my academic call, colleagues call me a practitioner because I, I I kind of straddle in between these two worlds. Um, and, and for me, I, I found early on that to, to do the type of practice that I'm, I'm interested in, um, in order to financially make it viable, I, I really needed a way to kind of offset the income um, and, and found that it allowed me to be a bit more selective in the types of projects I would, I would pursue or, or be able to afford the time to kind of work on. Um, so it created, it, it stemmed from a, it stemmed from a business model, basically, of, of trying to figure out how to get the most out of the practice um, with, without having to kind of sell the farm, so to speak, up in the practice. Um, and, and, to allow, and, and to allow one to be a little bit, you know, and I don't mean this in a, in a pompous way, I mean to be a bit more selective about the work. Um, um, so, you know, with that, I, I think the other thing that I, I'd like to say about that is that, um, you know, I, I was taught by some very great, very, very great teachers, people who dedicate themselves to architectural education. And, and I, I think to kind of honor them, I think that the tradition is really important that um, us as educators kind of practice and teach or attempt to practice and teach um, because it, it also helps to inspire, inspire the student um, to understand that you're kind of out there and you're, you're, trying, you're attempting to make architecture um, and make the architecture that you are passionately talking and educating them about. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll jump into a few visual things maybe to kind of get us, get us there. All right, so so everyone, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of pop into a couple of different questions. I'm going to kind of move around a little bit. Um, so, so maybe, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this title because I think this title is important. Um, when, when starting to think about how to, how to frame this discussion, I was thinking about a lecture that Peter Eisman gave in 2000 and for practice in which he proposed that the, the idea that there are a lot of practices, but there are very few practitioners that have a project um, and that the role of the project is a kind of a larger intellectual idea of practice. Um, and, and I've always found that to be really interesting that this idea that, um, and that, it, that the architecture one produces when thinking about the idea of creating a project type of practice um, 
has a certain kind of connectivity of the work, um, a kind of consistency or an exploration that it continues to kind of build upon from one project to another. Um, and I, I, I believe I kind of set that a bit as a, as a kind of challenge for my, myself. Um, it's, it's similar to like Colin Rowe talking about the hedgehog and the fox in that classic essay in Collage City. Um, but for tonight, what I th thought it was also important, something that I, I'm challenged by, is this issue of practice and time of product. And I think we're all we're all dealing with this right now. And at, from my generation, you know, and I think everyone can see that with my my gray hair, is that I, I was I was of that generation that was kind of taught anal through an analog method of drawing, how to navigate through early CAD. Um, representation, then three-dimensional representation through computer modeling, and now, of course, BIM modeling. Um, and I know we're all there right now. Um, and I, I, to me, I, I think it's 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 an interesting moment because um, how do we? So, for, for instance, is you know, we we tended to kind of gradually get into this idea of digital representation slowly and be slowly convinced by it. Um, and, it and it's become more and more efficient. And, and to some degree, it's, we have to be careful that we don't make the efficiency of it a, biz, a kind of a business model, but a, but a model for project excellence. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'd say for, for all, all, all our Revit friends here, you know, I think it's this issue of like, you know, how often do you make a, a custom component compared to place a pre-made pre component is, and that's something that, you know, I, I think is interesting to me is that we, we, that it's, it's an obstacle. I think in the beginning through early forms of representation, when we were hand drawing, we didn't think much, we thought about products in a very different way than we do now. I think now we have a tendency of thinking about products as solving entire specification session sections to buildings, and and we use them in some respects to kind of alleviate certain amounts of risks on projects. Um, I'm very interested in probably just the opposite um, approach, where where I'm, um, and I can talk about what specifications and how I use them, but I, I'm very interested in not losing sight of the idea of the component that is actually made of various bits of things, as opposed to thinking about it as a, a kind of one source product that can be integrated into a building project. Um, Gerard, do you have any uh, examples maybe that you could pull? There you go. Yeah, yeah. so let me, let me kind of dive into it a little bit. And um, so th these, are some, these are some painting studies by, by Charles uh, Sheeler. Um, and I use these as a kind of example of, a bit to talk about um, representation in my particular case being a kind of a Pennsylvania based practice and and being kind of fascinated by the kind of rule in the vernacular and and as we can see with his abstractions he's he's taking interests of, of European cubism and futurism and, and taking it through a lens of an abstraction of the American context um, and so maybe the kind of help position this argument a little bit is is to su suggest that the role of abstraction of elements and how we start to combine those elements could start to kind of make form. Um, and I'll, I'll give everybody a little bit of a quick background about maybe how this happened for me um, and, and why I think about why I think about the development of, of practice in a different way than, than thinking about products is um, I, I grew up in the base conditions of the Catskill Mountains. Um, and was fortunate enough to have directly over the hillside from us this bridge by Roebling. Um, and this is over the, this is the Delaware Aqueduct over the Delaware River, kind of near Port Jervis, New York. Um, and this, this idea about harvested materials from the place, I mean, obviously the braided cable is Roebling's kind of invention and kind of the, the twisting of the cables. And of course that comes from Western Pennsylvania. Um, but this idea of using harvested materials to kind of make the basin for the aqueduct that are items that can be found of the place, like the stone piers, et cetera, to me have uh, helped to kind of link the thing or tie the projects to the place. Um, and I thought what I'd do also share this image in, in 
of myself, I want to kind of tie my connections to Ohio in a little bit as well. And this interest in, you know, Charles Sheeler was thought about as a kind of precisionist, precisionist painter. And I spent many of my summers in my, in my junior high and high school years actually in Camp Perry, Ohio and Port Clinton, Ohio, because I was, I was quite heavily interested and was, a, and was heavily interested in, in international shooting. Um, and would go to the National Small Bar Championships in Camp Perry. Um, and it taught me this idea about performance and precision, um, which is something that, you know, I think in hindsight, right? I think you build a bunch of work and then you start to under try to understand yourself or your practice, right? Based on those influences. We tend to think about them only through our architectural educations, but we have to understand that in offices, we have the lives of the participants in the practice that are helping to form the work. And those influences, those lifetime influence, influences, I think are very interesting in the way they navigate through to your own work. Um, and, and it took actually time with Glenn Murcock for me to start to understand that it's the whole picture of one's life and understanding how, how it leads to the work as opposed to just the academic. Um, so another, for instance, is like in my hometown, um, we were fortunate enough to have a series of Paul Rudolph projects. This is the Truly School, which was, a, which was a, a school made out of a locally sourced concrete block in which he designed his own mold, mold for. Um, it worked with the site topography of the landscape. Um, it allowed for an open floor plan to the idea of, of elementary education and kind of the re and the kind of interconfigurarity of open space. So this idea that like a gymnasium can be opened and, re and be doubled or tripled, et cetera. The idea here is that education could be thought about as a new model and that one can kind of create different forms of interaction by the manipulation of the walls that were inside of this, el this elementary school now destroyed. Um, but these are types of things as, as a young person, not knowing what architecture is, I start to kind of gravitate to. Um, this being the now lost um, Orange County Government Center in Goshen, New York, by, once again, by Paul Rudolph. And these were projects in which I knew were different in my place growing up. And, and these are all these photographs actually are photographs that I had taken when awkward transition between college, and high school and college. And I had a slightly different trajectory where I didn't really know what I wanted to do and actually went to community college for two years before going to Syracuse University. But I found these things to be interesting and that's what stemmed my interest in architecture, allowing me to go meet this person, Vera Seligman, who was the Dean at Syracuse University, who was one of these, one of these kind of passionate educators. Um, who, who once again was a practitioner and an educator. Felt like, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to go to a school of architecture, I, I, I want the proof to be in the faculty, so to speak. You know, I, I, want, I want to and have a dean of a school be practicing um, and, and still be doing even competitions as part, as, and, and running a school and, and makes you understand that he is attempting to synthesize everything he values about practice in his own work and helping you understand as an educational model that those are the types of skills that one should learn as, a, as an architect in an educational sense. Um, and it led to projects like this, but this is like my freshman project at Syracuse. Um, so obviously two years at a community college, learning about architectural um, architectural technology. So I could have learned it a little bit on the back end, right? Learning about kind of building construction and surveying and these types of things and how to like lay out a septic system, learning kind of very technical things at the community college level. But then really going to Syracuse to really understand, under, understand the intellectual merits of what architecture is, what differentiates it from pure technology. Um, and so this project, this drawing kind of dates me being in the 1980s um, with some of these kind of See here that even rendered in this drawing is concrete block that we're, we're being asked as young the constructive quality of the things we design um, and not just thinking about them purely in a, um, in a kind of representational sense. I'm gonna pause a moment here. Okay. And because we, 
we were taught these things, right? We were taught the kind of classics, the kind of the, those architects in which uh, Werner Seligman really admired and kind of knew inside and out. And like part of our freshman kit as an architecture student was to get these books that were all in Italian that we could barely read, but, but it, it gave you a plan section and a photograph of every building. And it was this idea that you learn through observation was something that he thought was very important to us. And this idea kind of lives on with me about this idea of visitation to great buildings, meeting great architects, right? Um, but like one of my first projects when leaving, when leaving architecture school was, was making a bookshelf and understanding it both as an aesthetic thing, but also as a kind of technical thing as that one has to kind of build it and one has to think about material efficiencies, like the shelves are actually tapered to maximize the cuts of a single, out of a single sheet of plywood. Um, the steel is, is all being done here to eliminate welds and bolting. Um, so, so it becomes this combination of aesthetics um, and performance, right? That these things are kind of important. Um, and, and, and I think, Robert, maybe to kind of go back to this idea of the educational methods, right? I think that's something that I still do today as an educator, right? That, that there, there's this kind of importance to bring students out in the field to kind of show them buildings and how they are organized, but also to talk about technically how they're made. And then also through like my architectural detailing class, I hear some examples where, where we don't necessarily rebuild construction documents to figure them out, but in fact, we use the fragmentation of construction documents and, and images that are available of projects. And then we use that as a kind of reverse engineering exercise to kind of design how we think the building might be, have been made, right? To teach, the, to teach the students as well as the way I teach myself is this role of speculation about the detail is is really important to me that we it's important that we take the aesthetic lens always back through this idea of the technical one you know and the, you know if we think about like charles sheeler again like he in his house in doylestown he he talked about his stove which is the kind of performative thing of the home with, he called that his companion right but then he called this house the kind of cloister which to me always suggested this idea about that it's about the experience and about the aesthetic right and i think to me, that's one of the things that fascinate me, right? Is that when thinking about this idea about practice and time of product, right? How do you merge these things together? Um, and, I, and I do that with my partner, Debbie Battiston, who's on the other side of me right now here working. Um, and we do this as a collaboration. And, and, I, and we have been a very interesting collaboration because we're, we're husband and wife, we practice together. But we also, I always, I'm a firm believer in knowing your limitations, what you're good at, what you're not good at. And um, I think as, as a couple, as practitioners, we balance each other um, out in relationship to that. Um, so maybe, maybe when I talked about Mercat a little bit, I, I think it's probably important to give a little bit of context um, because I, I practiced, I started my practice in 90, 1996. Um, which was a very different time. And I, you know, when I look back at those projects, the work looks, has a certain strange consistency about it, even to the work that we do today. Um, but I, I needed, I needed, in 2011, I've, I've always admired Glenn Burkott's work. I think it's, I think many of us do. Um, and I, I felt that idea of seeking out mentorship at a kind of critical point of my career practice for a few years and then reach out and really meet a high level practitioner that's practicing at a very high level. And then use that as a way to kind of judge your work in relationship to it. Because I, I think we, we all as practitioners, we have this trouble of we get ourselves inside our boxes and we, we can use the awards programs as a way to get recognition, but, but it's hard to really know to get an opportunity to kind of, to know how you're thinking to see others how they think, to see how one can improve one's practice. Um, and I participated in 2011. I, I wanna make a point about this even before showing the work because um, Glenn Mercat runs a summer program and it's through, you can do a simple web search called Ozitexture, O-Z, Ozitexture, um, in which he runs a summer program along with his peers. And he chooses the, the 
very best of a very kind of important era in, I would say, Australian architecture of, of series architects that really look at the land and look at materials in a very kind of, in a very honest way. Um, they, they make you understand that nature is a tough thing. It's not, it's not, um, it's not about beauty, it's about performance, right? And that the beauty comes because of the performance. Um, and you go there and, it, and I think many of you would enjoy this. It's like, you, it's, it's the summer camp of architecture. I remember going there and you go, you're, you're there with about 25 other architects from around the world who are all kind of mid master and, and see the work and, but you're, and I'm going to wait a moment here with my internet. Okay. But what's very studio project and you're critiqued by Glenn Murcott, Richard Lapastier, Lindsay Johnson, Peter Stutchbury, and Britt Anderson. And you do, you get three critiques a day. You, you live, sleep architecture. Um, and, and you're, you're doing, you're doing that among, among a project, um, that is designed by Glenn Murcott. So it's, it's quite inspiring that you're, you're living the experience, um, in, in the Chauvin Valley, um, and you're you're and you're seeing the works of Murcott, Richard Lepassier, and Peter Stutchberry and Britt Anderson. You're seeing the work firsthand, um, and that that was very important to me because it helped me understand that there's something that ties, I think, really passionate architects, and one is that they 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 understand that kind of persistence is really important to projects um, and, and, and they're relentless about the pursuit of architecture. And, and it made me realize that, you know, you're not kind of alone, right? That you can start to see people practicing at a very high level um, with a real authenticity to them. Um, and, and the thing that they taught me, which I thought was really interesting was, they treat their clients as equals and they don't believe, they don't see themselves as a service, but they, they feel them they're, and they're an active participant with the client experience. And I was really happy to kind of get that kind of experience and knowledge from them because it made me realize that, you know, that, you know, nothing is given and all is earned through that method. Um, and there are many things I could talk about about this program, but I think if you're, a, you know, a mid-career professional, Right, and you're wondering about how you're doing, or if you're looking for inspiration, these are the types of folks that will that will do that for you. And, and as I was saying, like you know, 25 architects from around the world that you're working with in teams. I think you know the funny part of it was for me was like many of them thought they were just going to see projects by by you know, by Glenn Murcott, and then they didn't realize that you know they were going to be doing these this heavy intense studio project and be getting these kind of critiques. But to me, that was like it's like the ultimate architect masters. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll mention about this is on the lower left-hand side, that's, that's, that's an Aboriginal elder named Max Doubledum Harris. And one thing that's really important, that I think we forget about is, and I think when this idea about the reading of land and place, right, we, we tend to think about the American context, and we, we forget about the Native American context in which we practice. And I think when, when talking to a group of architects from Ohio, you, you know the mountains of Ohio, you know the landscapes, you, you know the Native patterns that, that were part of Ohio. And I, and I spend a lot of time thinking about those types of aspects when pursuing the work here that we have to understand it's not just the kind of post-industrial context that we're a part of, but we also have to think about the kind of pre-industrial context in which our landscapes are a part of. Um, and once again, this was this is an, an useful moment. Um, and I think maybe I'll, I'll stop there maybe, but maybe now show you all some early work, kind of the work before, before doing that trip um, and how Let's see. And how my sensibilities came about. So my, you know, you could, so for me, they came from kind of humble beginnings. I, um, you know, some of my earliest memories with my father was like, was like aspects of kind of appropriate tech, right? This, this idea of like 
patching a muffler with like a tomato paste can. This idea that you can kind of figure out how to solve problems, not necessarily by having the products you need, but by using the products at hand. And, and as, as a young person, as a child, one of my first things I was really interested in when I was taking apart every non-working appliance in the neighborhood, clocks and radios and these types of things. They would just give them to my parents because I was fascinated by taking things apart, apart and by drawing. And this idea about, and I think many of you are this way, it's like, it's this, this fascination towards how things work, I think is one of the aspects that really make architects architects. Um, you know, I work with a lot of students and I always ask that question, like how many of you have taken a, you know, took apart a small appliance and, um, and half, the, half the hands would raise in the, in the class. And then I would also, then the next question I would ask is, you know, how many of you made an environment out of a cardboard box when you were young? And generally it was, it was, it was even more hands, right? So by that point, you could pretty much have every hand in the room in an architecture studio and freshman studio engage with this idea of, the making of something, right? Through thinking about it through performance or the idea about thinking about it through aesthetics, right? Um, and so early works were things like this, where um, our first studio space, our first live work was, was I convinced somebody who had a vacant upper level above a beer shop that had an uninsulated, unused space um, to allow me to set up my first office here. So this was like my first studio build was just to build a bathroom, a shower room here in, in this old ice warehouse on the south side of Pittsburgh, um, you know, which my wife, when she would come to visit with this building, there were cracks in it where it would literally snow inside. Um, but this idea about working with the found condition of places is something that has continues to really interest me, right? And my fascination, even though I'm from the Catskills of New York, I was fascinated with Western Pennsylvania through, through some work experiences that I had bef before starting my practice. And I, I practiced for a very short amount of time outside of, outside of graduation. And I, I worked on a project at Carnegie Mellon for an architect named Michael Dennis in Boston and spent a year here in Pittsburgh and became fascinated because I was transferred here. I was working with the local joint venture office, became fascinated by Pittsburgh because it, it, embed it had embedded into it this idea about a kind of a rich past, but a heavy in investment in how things were made. Um, literally where the projects you would renovate, the steel would be marked with Carnegie. So, I mean, this literally is, is a rubbing off of a beam on a project, right? Um, or, or our context where grave markers are made out of gas pipes and rolled pieces of angle are made into lamps at Carnegie Mellon. Right, and these were really fascinating moments for me in the in the early 1990s when I first arrived in Pittsburgh, um, and because I realized that they this this town was like the way I was raised. It was it's about appropriate tech. Um, the now lost TNT Hardware Store, which is an image on the left hand side in the south side where my studio is and was. Um, items were screwed to the drawers. And I think many of you probably remember these types of hardware stores where you, you went to solve problems um, thinking about the appropriate tech, not necessarily trying to find the replacement of, right? Um, and to me, you know, that, that, that is a really kind of powerful thing when thinking about how to make architecture, right? Is that there, there can be many ways to solve a problem and not just one way, right? We know that kind of, we know that aesthetically, but we could also know that I think in a kind of constructive sense and a performative sense, et cetera. And the clues are right around me, right? That we have Andy Warhol, who's understanding this idea in his own art, this idea of kind of stenciling the ordinary and then suggesting that it's art, just kind of appreciation of something that one takes for granted, but, of it, but, but if you really start to look at it, it's quite beautiful, right? Um, and that led to these types of projects. So I'm showing you early projects in the 1990s. Well, I'm sorry, late 1990s, 96 to, to probably 98, where products, projects, you know, I, I look at them, they were, they were very kind of ambitious things at the time where you were kind of trying to express everything, like the air intake to um, um, basically to a mechanical unit, the expression of hot and cold water and how it mixes to make a sink. Um, making it so you understand how each element is layered as a system, 
And these types of projects to me were my first projects in starting my practice here in Pittsburgh, looking at, once again, the, the appropriate tech to make technology spaces. So these were young and being able to be afforded to kind of do some, some kind of quick fit out spaces for them. But, but utilizing found conditions of buildings, um, right? So exposing the, exposing the old steel, cement, cementitious fireproofing, fire retardant products to kind of make the cladding, and then doing things like material repurposing of finding like metals in a salvage yard and being able to use it for all the kind of window trims to kind of bounce the light of the Monongahela River into the, into the, into the space of the building to, to eliminate artificial light, um, as well as these are these are umbrella fabrics that I had a, a local boat com boat company make. That these are boat covers for off season boats, like we you all have up in Cleveland, right? And having these manufacturers actually make the products for the project, right? Kind of get the products from one industry and use them for another, and use them as deflectors to bring in, once again, to have a kind of art, a natural light strategy for a space, um, right? And then it just kept going, right? This, I look at these projects now and, you know, they're, I think they're, they're ambitious. You're, you're a young architect, you're trying to express everything, a metal stud, how you can make a shelf, how you can make pinup walls with home soap, but wrapping them with artist canvas. And it just kept going. And then, our, and then carefully, carefully, thinking about the aesthetic properties of these ordinary things. To me, these are types of things that epitomize, I think, the kind of the aesthetics of Western Pennsylvania and the kind of work ethic of this place. Um, and as you can tell, like it just kept going, right? Um, oriented strand board floors. And then, and then for like a tech company expressing every piece of EMT tubing. Hey Gerard, can I jump in? Or but sort of think about their lighting system like a circuit. Um, and using kind of clear metaphors with clients to help them understand the intent. Like if you're spending the money to do a fit out and you have to do something, how do you make it something that your employees or the folks that visit you, there's a kind of connection, right? Between the participants and the space. So Gerard, Gerard, you yes. hear me? so, cause we're not, we're gonna run out of time. All right. I really want you to get to some of the later work. How do you transition then your pre kind of Australian excursion to to now in your present day work where your work has really evolved? It's gotten very sophisticated. It's very thoughtful, um, especially with the articulation of the material through detailing. Mm -hmm. I mean that. that it's 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 really kind of changed in a dynamic. Is that a different type of commission or budget, or is it still the same resourcefulness that you're doing here? You're just you've just matured. Yeah, I think I, I look at it and think like the projects I did early on and the project I'm doing today are all the same. Um, it's just the 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 types of materials that you're allowed to use vary based on your, your client and your opportunity, right? That, that's maybe the first way I'll go. So should I show them like the live work studio first, maybe as an example? Yeah, that's, that'd be great. Okay, so let's, let's do something like that. Um, so, so once again, thinking about place, right? And so, so, and this is even bef so this is a project kind of before Mercot, but but an idea of, of to me it's it's kind of like teaching. I mean, for to me to become a good teacher, I had to relearn all the lessons that I was taught, right? And I think for someone when I think about someone like Mercot, I think I had this kind of preconceptions of what I thought Mercot was and how he would start to operate. And other great architects, maybe someone like Avaro Siza, et cetera. And I would, and I constantly am looking at architects and thinking about how do they think, right? Because you can read maybe how they think. And so this is this is a section from William Latrobe. I'm sorry, Benjamin Latrobe. And Benjamin Latrobe, of course, did the first White House. Um, but he had the, you know, so many people came to Pittsburgh and had the kind of ill-failed business. And in his particular case, he set up a ferry boat, 
uh, business that failed. Um, and, but when he was sending a letter to an investor, he did. He tried to explain Pittsburgh, and he said Pittsburgh's a section. And he drew this beautiful section, right? Downtown smoky thing. You got the Monongahela, you got the Allegheny, you got these coal stratas that are going through things like Mount Washington on the left-hand side. So you got resources, technology. Um, so when doing the, the Live Work Studio, and this is, the, this is the first project that I did that was a ground up that had basically an inside and an outside. Because I think it's important for everyone to understand when you're starting as a small practitioner, the opportunities typically are renovations and smaller interior things. In order for me to get outside of a project, I basically had to kind of save from projects and, and I had to kind of produce a project, the Live Work Studio number two for us. Uh, and as a demonstration to clients on how I think and how a building can be built that has an inside and outside, be a three-dimensional object, right? That, that lives up to the same qualities and aspirations that those smaller projects did. So, so this was a material investigation of the neighborhood south side of Pittsburgh um, and, and using it as a resource library and thinking about looking at the neighborhood materials and then thinking about how you might mess with them. Right, I, I believe a lot in like, you have to understand how to use materials properly and then maybe how to be a little bit naughty with them. This is kind of a good way to think about it. So these are the materials. Um, it's a row house project in the South side flats of Pittsburgh and which is made, it's, it's, it's meant to be an open planned home because we have our studio and part of it. This is. This is before we renovated our offices. We, but when we had a home office, um, home office is kind of upstairs here. I'll, I'll just do this for you. Um, so we have an office space here. We have, but what's interesting to me is we we put a, we put a skylight down the center of it, doing the opposite of what our neighbors do, which is the typical south side has a stair in the middle, and borrows only light from the front and back. We decided to put a canyon in the middle. Um, to bring light into the center of the house and also use it as a, as a way to kind of passively ventilate the structure so we can bring airflows in and out. Um, but it's a narrow row house, but this idea of how do you make a row house seem very, very have a large sense of volume. So, a second. So it's a very simple project in the way of it's, a, it's it's two concrete block bearing walls, locally sourced concrete block in which we created a unique pattern for, and I'll show you that in a moment. But it's, it's a simple house with that no walls really touch, very little walls touch the ceiling from the front to the back. So there's a street side and there's a garden side. And I'll show it here. So the street side is, is, is definitely inspired by the kind of grittiness of, um, we're right near the old Duquesne Brewery, the old corrugated buildings that make up the bottling and shipping buildings here outside my window. So we wanted to take in the corrugations and we use weathered steel here because from this window, you could actually sight down to downtown and see the weathered US steel building, which is now, which is now the UPMC building. Um, but this outside facade was an idea of a mahogany screen that takes on the horizontality of the residential fabric and then a kind of vertical corrugated iron that is taking on the industrial and then sandwiched between these two concrete block walls. And then once again, kind of reappropriating, right? Getting the asphalt shingle that's typically put on a kind of roof and turning it into a vertical surface to become the rear garden thinking about this kind of modesty of the asphalt shingled homes that are, make up our neighborhood as well as the masonry ones. So um, I'll just show you a couple of quick images maybe. So Robert, so here on from the entry, right? You're able to kind of sight immediately from the front door out to the garden. That, and so this house is oriented kind of east-west, um, but it acts, it, it, but it can, it, manages to steal all that southern light because of the central skylight that's up above that central shaft, which is, a, which is up here. Uh, but here's that kind of trick where the concrete block, once again, you know, made in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, nearby. Right, so you get the aggregates, you, you even get the debris, you get the, you get the pieces of iron, you get this kind of iron spotting in the concrete block which once again, to me, grounds it to the place. Um, and then the interior is, is all made out of maple, 
plywoods and hardwoods and drywall where we need it for either light to bring to help light bounce around into this interior or for kind of fire protection for aspects of certain parts of the roof area. Um, Don't and, forget the channel glass. Yeah, there's a channel glass there that separates a garage from, from the living space, um, which was right there on the right hand side. Um, it, there's the studio looking towards the bedroom and I guess some details, right? right? So see how the openness of this floor plan, right? That, that the, the cabinet units, this, the closets of the bedroom don't touch the ceiling, right? Because it's, and, and materials don't touch other materials. There's this kind of logic that when one material gets close to another, there has to be a reveal or a change in material that everything becomes kind of articulated um, in relationship to this. Now, whether this costs more or not, I mean, it's tricky. Like I, I had this firm belief early on that if you work with the modest materials, that will help accommodate the labor, right? Because if you work with, you gotta save somewhere. I mean, this model doesn't work so well anymore, but it used to work really well, I think in the 90s and the early 2000s, right? Where materials were cheaper and labor was high, you know, but now I think we all face this problem with like all materials are now kind of more expensive. Um, but the methodology, I think, is something I still bring into the work. Um, there's a glass floor because we're trying to make a transition between what is the public experience of the building. So in our particular case, we have a stair that goes up to a roof terrace that we're able to look at the city in Oakland. But we have a glass bridge that brings you to the private space, the bedroom. So once, so once again, there. so if you're going across literally a bridge inside your house, once again, thinking about if Pittsburgh is a section, right, like, like Benjamin Latrobe has talked about, that this house is as well a section, right? And that to me is really important that if Pittsburgh is a sectional city, this is a sectional house that sits within the city. Um, and so that becomes, I think, a kind of a working method to me. It's like, it's, I'm constantly thinking about that application, right, of kind of appropriateness of place. Um, and there's the roof terrace, right? So you can kind of end that sequence, come up, and here you can then site to downtown Pittsburgh, or you can site up to the Cathedral Learning in Oakland. Um, and there's more channel glass that's bouncing that light from this upper vestibule down deep into the building, right? Down into the studio, which then brings it down into the entry. Um, and there's that motor motorized skylight that's set within that that sedum roof, right, that's acting as the thermal chimney to the house, right? So you can easily ventilate the home and, and really offset the need for, for air conditioning during certain times of the year. Um, so I think that's, so that, that's, how's that? As a, as a question. No, I, I, think, I think that's good. Um, you know, you've got a lot of very interesting projects and in, I really enjoyed visiting uh, the tree bark house. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's the formal name for it, but yeah, what, what's, okay. from a materiality standpoint, I think it's a very intriguing solution. Well, let's, let's jump into that one then. So, because I think everyone's going to start, I think if you hear me long enough, you'll start to, you'll start to get it, right? And I think like Robert, you're, you're, you're talking about is like there's, you'll start to understand the methodology and how it starts to apply itself to different scales. And so we can do this with a commercial building, we can do this with a residential building. So um, what Robert's talking about is, uh, we, we sometimes call this the bark house because it's literally, it's literally covered with bark. It's with a, a chestnut bark on it. And, um, and we, we have a client who, who purchased a home in which, in which had failed due to kind of moisture and dampness problems and became a bit of a, a liability. Um, because of the kind of mold problems in the home, they were interested in leveling the house, but loved the property because the property adjoins one of our, one of our parks here in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and, but at the same point, there, there are walking trails in the park and there was this interest in disappearing um, in that, you know, we tend to think about architecture as being kind of monuments, right? And we, we tend to think about, we, we wanna make the building stand out. This was a client who wanted to actually do probably just, I would say clearly just the opposite um, and wanted to make this, this project kind of disappear. So this idea of the moth and bark 
this idea about how do you put a home within a kind of wooded landscape that people can walk, be walking a trail 100, 150 yards away, but not necessarily see the house as a foreground building, right? And so, you know, that, that of course fascinates us. And I think we're all, many of us architects have been fascinated by the role of camouflage, right? And then you, you also start to understand like, you know, architects were also interested in this for a long time. Like Raymond, Raymond Hood in the, in the 1920s and early 30s was doing the Patterson residence um, in Ostling, New York, in which he was dealing with the same problem. as like, I got this big house. I have to, I want to try to break down the scale of it. And he's literally looking at military camouflaging to try to descale or re rescale the home. Um, and these, so, so to me, I'm constantly kind of going back and forth, like my knowledge of architects and interests and ideas about how they solve problems. And then, and then thinking about, like thinking about the kind of Aboriginal conditions, right? Thinking about the kind of first people of our place, right? And here in Western Pennsylvania and thinking about the early structures that were made here in which were bark structures. And so, so to me, you know, it's, I wanna make a building be of its place. Like let's really make it of its place. And so let's, where you're taking a little bit of the wood and the bark um, and when it's kiln dried, it, it's impervious to things wanting to eat it, um, you know, but it, it allows the house, this house, right? This is what we started with. This was a house done by a Pittsburgh architect named John Peckron, um, in which, as you could tell, it was kind of, it, it kind of put the house kind of into the ground, basically, and that was kind of problematic. Um, because he, the, the, the drainage system failed pretty early on in this house and, it, and trees kind of smothered it along the park and it, it became a problem. Um, so what our interest was to possibly think about, thinking about a tree and, and thinking about how you make a house like a tree. So, so, you know, how, so how do you do that? So this felling idea of kind of cutting a tree at an angle became kind of the inspiration of making a building where we kept the original foundations of this house and we put a new house on top of it, much like a, like a tree house. So that when you're up in the main level, you don't feel like you're on the, the street. I actually deny views to the sidewalk and to the cul-de-sac and I acknowledge the views only out to the park. Um, but we, we do this through a continuous slice of the envelope. So we extrude up the walls, but then we did a continuous slice like a chainsaw cutting through a tree right, this kind of felling idea. Um, and I, I'll go through the house very rapidly just for time so we can look at some other things. But, but we have a main level, which is that, and then we have a ramp that actually allows you to descend down into the bedrooms and then ultimately to kind of make that connection out to the park for this, for this couple. Um, and we utilize the old part of the house and then we build on top of it. So the house now is this, right? This irregular form, right? That sits on the existing foundation. Um, it's irregular because it's starting to acknowledge specific landscape views of the building site. Um, we de-emphasize garage door. We really de-emphasize the idea of the street. And then we, we acknowledge the landscape and the park. Um, once again, through the material choice, right? The idea of the bark being the camouflage of the building to the landscape. Um, and what's nice about it is it works all season. And to me, a number of our projects we photograph in multiple seasons when we document them, because a lot of these projects, and I think it's important to think about as an architect, you're not thinking, designing for one season in, in this region, this part of the country, right? We're, we're designing for basically three cycles. And, and so we have to think about that performatively, which we always do, but, but how do we think about that aesthetically is also something that I think we have to think about as architects. Um, so this building has, is attempting to, once again, kind of camouflage itself, once again, during different seasons. Um, and, and here's that wall, I think Robert, we walked along, right? Where you can, you can see the, the bark cladding, right? And, and the way, the way we're trying to dematerialize a home. Um, and you can see the plinth of the old home that sits below it, the original brick of the lower level. And that allows this to happen, right? And is that if you build this kind of, this plinth, if you will, this, this belvedere to the landscape, um, this plateau, I think, you know, that maybe John, John Hudson would talk about, is 
it, it allows the house to understand that this is a house that's part of a park. It's not part of it's not part of the cobble side. Right when you're here, it's about appreciating the landscape and about being in nature, even though you're in the in the neighborhood, right? Um, and then you that sequence is about the descent down to the private spaces. So there's the ramp that brings you down to the master bedroom, and then even further down into guest bedrooms of the home, like that. And once again, you know, working with I would say a pretty modest budget in this particular case where, you know, where you're looking at railings that are made out of pine, you know, where we're, 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 we use, um, we use birch plywood everywhere because it was like the cheapest plywood, you know, we, we try to dig through it and find the best grade of it that we could for the cost. Um, so that you can, you can do this kind of dialogue, right, what, that you see even with our live workspace, this, this idea of the combination between white surfaces and materials. Um, you know, I, I think that I think when you go to a place and you feel real materials, it makes a difference in the experience. Um, and and when thinking about a house in a landscape, I thought to me it's really important that you have recognizable materials that are are, if you will, a metaphorical relationship and a physical relationship to the very landscape that it's a part of. Um, and I think that's the last image of it. But this 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 idea that you know. A house, once again, can lock itself or link itself or camouflage itself into an, into a landscape, right? Kind of cloak, if you will. Um, you know, how do you? Once again, it's like you know, how do you? How can you be in the shadows, right? And and still make an architecture that's really kind of powerful. Um, so what about what about thanks. current work? I know, I know you have uh, two very ambitious projects one in Sewickley and one in Maine that um, yeah. really, really, um, I think, uh, take on a lot of what you've developed in so much of your early work that have just become almost more iconic uh, projects for you now. Yeah. So maybe maybe we'll do, I'll show, I'll, show, I'll show the house in Maine and then I'll, then I'll show the house in Sewickley and if we have time to look at anything else, we will. So let's, so the main house, so this is a house, you know, this was, this was done after 2011. So this was done, this is a, you know, I think, I think as architects, we, we all, we all find, <laughs> I think we all find the stories of our work really interesting, um, right? Because I mean, I think every project has a story and I, you know, and, and, and to me, you know, I, I think when you're doing work, it's like, you know, you, um, you know, you're the protagonist of your life story and your projects all have stories associated with with your life. And this is a project in which I'm sure everyone has these in their office where you, you start a project, it sits on a shelf where literally we had a model sitting on our shelf for a decade, where, where we had a, a couple who said, someday we're going to retire and we're going to retire here. Um, and then it went, it went nowhere for a decade and a model sat on the shelf. And it allowed me 10 years to look at a model and look at it and this is one of those things that I always, I always think about someone like Ewan Utzon who would, who would say like, you know, that it, it, it takes patience to do architecture. It takes time, right? And I think we're, we're, as practitioners, we're always up against time of our clients, times with schedules, times getting construction documents done, um, time to build, right? But this idea about taking it slow. So this, this was a project that's, on a really interesting part of Northern Maine, I would say one of the last ports bef before the Canadian border, before Nova Scotia, um, in which I was interested in a couple of things. One is this is, this was a, is a site in which, um, when thinking about the qualities of place you, and, how you, and how you want to leverage every aspect you can. So the site is here and it's part of a bay but it has a really kind of wonderful condition because it's at the mouth of the bay. So it allows you to kind of see a specimen island or two, where literally you could see the seals um, during certain times of year. And so you get a view of the Atlantic, but you also get the bay. Um, and how do you do a house in which starts to um, acknowledge that experience of this place of being kind of on the edge between a body of water and a bay condition, right? Is, and this house sets itself up into a series, what, what we often call kind of three lanterns, 
but the, but the house is thought about almost like a series of rock formations. So I'm thinking about the kind of granite and the kind of shoreline of this place um, and understanding the kind of time and, and the way in which this stuff is kind of shattered and sheared, right? As part of the geological condition of this place. Um, I wanted a house that would be kind of spatially organized, kind of like a, like a rock formation, but at the same point, start to acknowledge these kind of differences. And so the house sets itself up on this very slight series of angles, which perceptually change the way in which you start to think about each tunnel of this house. So, so the house is kind of organized quite, quite simply, I think, as a series of kind of parallel layers. And then be, so you got large spaces like bedrooms, and then you have narrow spaces that contain things like elevators and stairs, large spaces that contain kitchen, dining, livings, narrow spaces that are things like pantries and log storage and hearth, right? And then once again, large spaces that are thinking about things that are a little bit more intimate, like studies um, and vestibules. And then being up in this part of the country, one, one has to make a whole career out of moving snow, right? So all of a sudden the garage becomes this kind of larger piece of program because you have to think about the vehicles and then you have to think about the snow removal equipment. You have to think about propane and then you have to think a lot about being off the grid when one with generators, but also with just fuel production of log storage. So this house has a whole, has a whole functional property of thinking about how to store logs during the good seasons of splitting lumber, storing it all underneath this, this narrow zone and then mechanically lifting it up to serve the fireplace. So, so, so getting the call basically after a decade and then revisiting it. So this was an earlier model that you, it somewhat sets up the diagram, but it's, there's some things that were wrong with it, but this idea of allowing projects to take time um, allow them to kind of refine themselves. And so here's, here's the final house, which lives up to some of these ideas, I think, um, connecting it to the landscape, connecting it to the geological condition, the site views, um, then harvesting the materials kind of locally for it. Um, not everything, but you know, thinking about the stone being kind of sourced here, right? Then I've got the, we have the cedar, right? And then, but then we have a house that's made here of zinc, right? And some cement panel that is just being used to kind of help to, to define only the apertures that are out to these view conditions. Um, and and this, this idea about putting the house in, into the landscape where you go there and you're, you're intentionally always set up of being kind of either in a zone that leads you to another space that then allows you to kind of prospect out to that landscape. And here you can see this, this, this challenge, right, where, you, where it's all about the garage, but then thinking about it as a layer, right? Thinking about that as a kind of vehicular equipment layer, right? And then setting the house up and then there's a there's a hatch here for a log drop to store all the logs and sorry, all the all the all the split lumber for the fireplace and then the entrance sequence which sets itself up with articulating and I'll show you in a moment there are a series of gutters right well even the collection of water is something that we need to kind of be considerate of right in the way we get the water off the roof right and get it away from the building in this particular case but but even even thinking about the gutter as an extension of the roof and setting it up as a threshold to bring you to the front door, right? So there's a, there's a log that's literally used here to kind of set up the kind of archway, if you will, right? The kind of threshold to this kind of void that sits within this stone wall that then sets up that kind of, the, the sequence from the landscape condition to the internal sequence of the house. And, and here you can start to see it where, you know, we're, and this was a house that was kind of challenging because it's, it's on a budget, right? So we're, we're, once again, we're thinking of, and we're using some of our typical methods of using hardwood and then thinking about using the hardwood on the walls, you know, and, um, and then using plywood of the same species. In this particular case, everything's white oak. Um, and then, but even this, this idea of the fireplace to me was this, this idea about the cave within the cave, right? That, you know, you, you think about kind of native conditions about fire and the ancient conditions of fire. And you think about the early settlers and the role of the kind of nook fireplace in which you would literally kind of 
be within the fire. The owner to kind of get to this idea about having this Brunford fireplace, but to kind of make a space that sits within the, the larger space. Um, a stair slot that brings you up to a bedroom level, right? Or the kind of slot, being in the slot, the kitchen, dining, living, right? Um, or this whole idea, like I was talking about with log storage, right? That we have a hydraulic lift in the, in, in the basement condition of this home. And then we, we, we hydraulically lift up the lumber to serve the fireplace that's on the right-hand side, right? So you can constantly be, uh, you know, be storing things and servicing things. So it gets back to that whole issue that I was talking about at the very beginning, right? That it's, you know, in thinking about materials and in thinking about practice at a time of product, right? Here we're making, we're making things uh, because, because I'm, I constantly keep being kind of interested in that idea of the aesthetic and the performative. All right, how's that for Maine? Is that pretty good? So how does that transition to so weekly? <laughs> it's so weekly, okay. So you, there, there was, I mean, I know that when you came to visit, I mean, you, you, you all were asking me questions about, you know, client relationships and how do you, how do you do this? Right. And, um, you know, is, you know, is there, is there a kind of a magic to this? And there, and then I think we are, we're all in the same game. It's like, it's, 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 it's about treating clients as equals and, and it's also about being in it for the long game of a project. And, um, and projects don't necessarily finish quickly or pleasantly, right? You have, you're gonna have, you have moments along the way with projects, they're gonna be difficult. Um, this, this, is a, this was a challenging project for us. And this is a project in, in an area of Swickley, which is, which is west of Pittsburgh. And it, and it makes sense when you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about Pittsburgh during the Industrial Revolution, and that um, the, the I would say the important people of industry, right? Um, so, so this is this is Benjamin Franklin Jones of Jones and Laughlin Steel, one of the large steel producers here in during the during the Industrial Revolution in Pittsburgh, right? A competitor of Andrew Carnegie. Um, um, they all cited their houses west of the city because the prevailing winds are all coming from Ohio, right? And they're coming up the Ohio River. Um, so before the air pollution was coming, this is where they built their, their grand houses. Um, and this, this project's not going to be one in the way of modesty of construction methods. This is probably gonna be the opposite, but, but it's going to be a project I'm gonna show you that the, the, the role of connection and the role of the detail and the appreciation aesthetically and compositionally of every detail matter. But, but what happens when you're given the opportunity to, at a larger scale for, for, a, for a client who, who, is, who is interested in, in a certain level of refinement, but also a certain amount of authenticity and logic. So, so this, is a pro, this is a project that we've been working on for a decade um, in which we're hopefully in our final phase of. Um, so, so the original, so thinking about landscape as having a memory is an interesting one. And it's been a thread so far. Um, so this is a Jones and Laughlin steel mill, right, on the Monongahela River. But this, this is the house for Benjamin Franklin Jones. And, and this is up in Swickley. And, and this was a project that was designed by Rutan and Russell. And we probably don't remember who they are. Um, but it's important probably to understand, like, they arrived here in Pittsburgh in the 1800s. Um, with H.H. H. Richardson when doing the original Allegheny Courthouse and their firm presence stayed. Um, and, and Rutan was one of those original partners. Um, um, one of the, so when, they, when Richardson passed away, right? And he stayed here in Pittsburgh, did a number of projects, but he does the large estate for Benjamin Franklin Jones. What's curious, if you go visit this portion of Western Pennsylvania and you go to Swickley and you, and, you, and you explore the landscape of Swickley Heights where this is located, something interesting happened, which was these were large homes in which, um, in which fell into disrepair. The families mostly moved away from Western Pennsylvania when they did it, we get even more profitable, right? Moving to Long Island, moving to Rhode Island, et cetera. 
um, these houses fell into disrepair. And when you, when you talk to historical society, and this is something that became very important when we were presenting this to the Historic Review Board, our proposal for this landscape, was to us, it was interesting, we were interested in how, how building a large home for, for a family um, that emphasized the landscape and, and de-emphasized the architecture. Even though you're gonna see this house and say, it's, there's a lot of architecture here, but it, didn't, it doesn't plant itself on top of the hill. It nestles itself mid-range on the hill. And, and it, it attempts to, um, I always say it, it, it tends to have two parts of a house and I'll get into it in a second. So this is the current, con this was the condition about, about 11 or 12 years ago where the historic homes of the landscape are, are being lost at a rapid rate and very few things kind of remain. So that, that large home, right, um, the BF Jones estate is now lost, it's gone. Um, the working portions of the farm were in ruin and we have a client who had the foresight to save, to save portions that were still able to be saved. So what we did here was we, we saved two fragments of the site, the, the original Gothic arch barn and a silo that was part of a larger stable here that was lost in fire. Um, and we came up with a strategy of restoring those buildings and letting those be the prominent features when seen in the landscape from those people driving around this landscape and then pushed the house down into the land a bit more so that it can only really be seen from its own property and not from seen from the properties around it. Um, and in order to do that, right, one, one has to really study the site. Once again, this is kind of a Mercot thing where, you know, I think Glenn Mercot talks about this very well where he says, you know, he wants to have a relationship with a client, wants to visit a site well before he starts to design it. And, this being a project where we started the barn restoration first, um, then the silo restoration, and then the house, it allowed us to really study and learn the land and to think about how to put a house on this land. Um, and this is, this is the model of the house um, in which I, I always say that the house is set up in this way where one's kind of a stick and one's kind of a rock. Um, stick lays on the land, the rock is kind of embedded in the land. Um, the barn over here on left, the silo. So the organizational strategy for this was to draw a line between the center point of the barn and the center point of the silo, uh, connecting the two and making a water element that stretches through the house, if you will. Um, dining room table that's actually on the axis of the swimming pool, the reflective pool. Some studies, starting to think about the building, um, thinking about it in a number of different ways. Um, even though it's a large building, it's, it, it, it attempts to be very energy efficient, you know, starting with the very beginnings with the idea of geothermal wells, but then kind of keep going with a highly insulative envelope and daylighting strategies, et cetera. Um, but the house, um, more sketches, but really thinking about the path of the sun, all these kind of things that we know we should be doing. Um, and some early renderings of the house and how it stitches. Um, and the, the house is, it's, it has, it will have intensive green roots um, to deal with the stormwater problems, to keep, to manage all the stormwater on the property. Um, it has white Portland cement, um, which is a very challenging science to figure out how to use white Portland. Um, and then it has charred siding with a kind of steel frame and wood system, um, a heavy timber glue lamb roof system that articulates the heavy loading of the green roofs that will sit on top of it. Um, but here I'll, I'll just give you some of the fast ideas of it. So there used to be a, an old horse path that would bring you from the Jones estate to the working stables. We, we brought back that memory by having a ramp that works up through the house and ultimately out of the house and back up the hillside to be about that horse ramp memory. Um, and that helps to kind of organize the home. Um, the, the house is organized, oops, I went ahead here. So kitchen, dining, living on the main level, the relationship to the water elements and the silo and the barn. The, the barn has been renovated into, a, in, into basically an event space barn. Um, and this ramp brings you up to a master bedroom that then prospects over a green roof back out to the landscape or you descend down to a glass covered gallery 
that then feeds a series of bedrooms off of it. And then ultimately this kind of cantilevering bridge um, platform that basically sits out there, um, the bedrooms. Um, but I'll talk about a couple of things. So first thing is that this is the barn. And to us, it was really important to keep the authenticity of the barn, but bring it up to energy code. So as we all know with old barns, the challenge here is your client likes likes the ruggedness of the interior, but how do you insulate it? So what we ended up doing here was we replicated all the historic details of the building because the exterior siding was, was is the interior finish, right? Um, but we actually, we actually framed an outer skin to this whole building like a jacket and closed celled insulation, the walls and the roof, and then repropose all the historic details about seven to eight inches beyond the old sheathing of this barn to get the thermal insulative wrap and at the same point be able to keep the historic interior. So, so this does a number of things really nicely. It, it, it doesn't really change the look of the building from the historic landscape. One sees the old barn, one recognizes the memory of the place, but it also allows you to have the authenticity of that memory on the interior of this room. Um, and even here, right, similar methods of like, how does the new touch the old? Well, well, Douglas fir, but this Douglas fir is is milled differently. Is it kind of expressed differently? Um, it doesn't touch. It creates a reveal. Um, so you understand it's a new layer that's participating in that context. Um, the silo is a restoration project that we learned a bunch about silos, which was that grain silos, of course, are dealing with with the pressure of the grains being a, being a displaced load, and how do you put a, we put a stair inside of it as a as a if, as what our client calls a sundowner deck, so you can go up there and watch the sun set to the west. But how do you put a stair inside of a silo that that will not take point loads? So we we actually have inserted the stair within the silo. So we actually put a period a, a series of beams, gray beams underneath the silo ring beam uh, to support that hot dip truss-like element that then has a stair that weaves up it that doesn't bear on the terracotta of the silo. <laughs> um, and then the house turned into has turned into this long project for us, which has been, we, we built the stick and we, we roughed in the, the rock, if you will. And then, so we, this is a project in which We've been, as I mentioned, we've been working on a long time. The, the client's been in, if you will, the stick now for three years. And now we're in the phase of now finishing up the rock. Um, but here you see some construction photos of the heavy timber that's supporting the intensive green roof, uh, the steel frame, um, the kitchen, dining, living, and how, once again, it's, it's, it's the plateau to the landscape. Um, a similar idea that you had seen in that house in the park for us, right? This idea that you're here and you're kind of in the landscape. Um, but this led to a whole series of kind of material investigations for us. So we're very interested in a in a in a, a house that is authentic to its materials. So when when in the ground, we wanted to reveal the concrete and we wanted to kind of revisit a lost art form, at least here in Western Pennsylvania, of producing. Uh, something that I'd seen at Carnegie Mellon, like Henry Hornbossel at the College of Fine Arts did a, did a bush hammered white concrete base to the building that we would walk by every day and never pay attention to. And to me, um, I was very interested in, in kind of rediscovering that method of, of working with local aggregates with, with white Portland cement and then shattering the aggregates to make this white concrete but to do it in such a way that we thermally isolate the outside condition from the inside condition. So you're, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a rigid foam thermal, bridge, thermal break, right? To avoid the thermal bridging so that we could have interior concrete and exterior concrete. And this is the mock-up that we made kind of looking at all the unusual and difficult conditions that the, con the concrete contractor was going to kind of encounter when building the building. Um, and it led to even the design of all the tools for the kind of for if you, the, for the kind of post concrete finishing of it. So 
to protect edges because we're really interested in keeping the paste of the concrete at the, at the things like contraction joints and control joints, um, but then bush hammering the field of the concrete. And so, so this whole idea about learning the methodology of, of the methods of construction and teaching and learning with the contractor kind of hand in hand, how to kind of rediscover this technology, right? In, in making this concrete. So these are the mock-ups, the kind of bone yard at that point, and then implementing that idea. So there's the gallery condition to the rock condition of the project in which it's gonna have a, it has a steel plate floor, a Corten steel plate, wax steel plate, wax Corten steel plate floor in which all the systems kind of run in a raceway underneath it to service all the bedrooms with all the kind of mechanical systems. Um, there's a glazed skylight system that's going to be sitting on top here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then it services these, these bedrooms. But I want to show you on the left hand side. The, the, the complexity of building basically the structural wall, then, then putting in place the rigid insulation, then putting in the formwork to create the, 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 the six, there's a 10 inch pour, then an insulative layer, and then a six inch pour. A six inch pour that actually is all fiber and actually has no reinforcing. Um, it's a non-structural condition. Um, and, but it led to this, I mean, and, this idea about having a client who's in it for the long game, right? A 10 year project and kind of keeping the faith in the project, right? Um, and I think this is this issue that I talk about is like, you know, working with clients as equals, right? And understanding and taking them through the process for, for basically 12 years on this project and, and still having the desire to finish it, right? Um, and here are some recent photos where you know you can start to see things like the guest bedroom and starting that's that's a log rack that's going to be on the right hand side. There's the there's the fireplace, um, but you could you could see how we're you know we're thinking about even rough concrete as 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 casework, right? I mean we're literally building casework quality formwork in order to reveal that craftsmanship of the building. And here are a couple recent photos for you all. So the approach, right, we're reconfiguring the drive, but, but this gives you a good sense of it. Big charred siding kind of building, hiding the garage door. There's an auto court on the left. And this looks a lot like the model I just shown. So it's like, um, but here we are. I mean, this, this, this was taken last week to give you a sense of this thing. Um, silo, barn, right, the kind of, the kind of, if you will, the kind of pathway that kind of comes off of the ramp, um, the guest bedroom wing, um, and, and this was quite nice where you can see now what we're trying to do, right? The kind of point of connection, the beginnings of the excavation for the reflecting pool and, and the idea of kind of getting into kind of reworking finally the kind of last bits of this scheme in this landscape. Um, and, because as you move through this house, what's also to me very important is that each part of the house frames a different aspect of the landscape. So the idea here is that you don't get the same view twice. And so each condition frames it in a unique way. Uh, ultimately, even going down to the silo, the silo you go up at, you don't get to look back at the house. You only get to look towards the west. Hey, Gerard. By, by doing this house in the way you've been phasing this over several years, what kind of difficulty or added expenses did it bring to the project? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think everybody will recognize this. Um, you know, during, during a kind of pandemic construction cycle, this, this, this oh, let me just get back out of this for a second. Get, I'll get into this image here. Oh, whoops, sorry. Oh, one, one last. Okay, I'll, I'll hold on. Um, so let's see, can I answer the question? Um, you know, this project took like over a year to rebid uh, to give you a good sense of it. And we did shift contractors during the project process. Um, and, and it also took kind of retraining. Um, and I think 
This is something that maybe we as a profession have to do more of when, when thinking about this idea of practice and time of product is we had a poor, we poured much of this white concrete with these level of finishes five years ago. And then we, but we had to, we had to kind of pick it up again and, and do those same finishes for like the auto court wall this past fall and do the reflecting pool and do some other things, right? So this idea about, about understanding the procedures and, and working with contractors to understand that, that they have to be willing to understand the procedures in place to make this concrete, right? And that it's, it's, it's kind of humbling for everyone. Like I, I just find like, to me, working with, working with builders and working with clients and, and understanding that we're, we're, that this is kind of a collaboration, but, but like it, it took a little bit of convincing with a new concrete contractor to make them understand like that, that the architect knows a little bit about concrete, right? Is like, um, you know, we worked with a consultant who worked with with Tadando Ando on the on the um, on the Pulitzer Building, um, and and under, and so we we learned a lot through the R and D of all those mockups were then lost, but we, but it's important to understand that the documentation, right, the the methods. Are ones that can be kind of relearned. We can transfer that knowledge, and and that's been working really smoothly on this project. You know, picking up a project three, four years later, new construction team, but understanding that the the architect actually has knowledge, right? And it's and that it's not just the documents, but it's but you're part of the collaborative act of making a building. Um, and it you know it takes the right kind of builder who wants to work that way with an architect, right? Um, does that help to answer it a little bit? Yes, I think so. Um, we are, uh, we have used a lot of our time and I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to any questions, um, but uh, just wanna thank you, Gerard. I think it was, uh, it's very interesting always to see your work. And I wish we had more time and maybe we can revisit some of your other projects because you do do more than houses and uh, you have some very intriguing uh, projects that I've, I've been fortunate to visit. Um, I would like to say that uh, Kate has put in uh, the chat box, um, the form for your HSW credits. So that's there. And then also, um, that you have some students that have uh, have <laughs> added uh, some comments uh, that were very uh, grateful to your teaching and you've been very inspirational to them. Well, that's nice to see. Oh, it's good to see you. Yeah. 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 Um, Kate, Steve Kordowski has a question. I don't know if his mic works this time, but maybe you could turn him on and maybe he can ask one question. You there? Yes. Yeah, it really wasn't a question, Gerard, but uh, you know, I really liked how you bring the academics into the built environment. Uh, in fact, uh, when I wrote this, not liked, more jealous <laughs> how you structured your practice. Uh, I really enjoy seeing the solutions that are unique to each project rather than forced into an office vocabulary. Um, so I, I really don't have, uh, and this is unique to me, I really don't have a question. I just love the idea of a pr practitioner exceeding the expectations on a project. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I mean, it's humbling. I guess, I guess my question is, um, if, if, if I'm in the Pittsburgh area or if you're ever in the Cleveland area, uh, will you grab a drink with me? Any, any time, absolutely. Okay. Careful That's what awesome. you agree Good to. Good answer. <laughs> Careful what you agree to. But I really, I, I really enjoyed it, yeah. Well, I have to say, I, I always love hanging out with my Cleveland architect friends, so please. Well, it's, it's, it's a shame you didn't engage me in it, but that's okay. <laughs> we will do that next time. You bet. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Okay, I think we are just, we are at the end of our time. Again, I wanted to thank you. Uh, again, as always, great getting together. I look forward, I saw you a few weeks ago, of course, but I look forward uh, to seeing you again. And I wanna thank all the participants for joining us tonight and taking part of your day uh, to see some great work from our friends down in Pittsburgh. Uh, thank you all for, for wanting to hear, hear what, what I do here. and. Um, and please, if you're ever in the Pittsburgh area, I'm happy to happy to talk architecture. You betcha. Anytime. So that's what we do. So, Robert, great to see you. Yeah, great seeing you as well. Take Thanks. care. Thanks again for the opportunity. Great. See y'all. Bye-bye.